for him when he was a columnist? And didn't you just want to wake up in the morning, grab that coffee, and read Tom Beale's column? Yes. Yeah. And bring him back. Bring him back. <laughs> and have you ever known anyone to write about science so clearly and so wonderfully that you understand what he's talking about. And that's one of the things I really admire about Tom. He's a wonderful writer, and he's agreed to moderate four panelists to today who are going to explain a lot about Tucson's weather, and I appreciate all of you being here. So thank you very much. And now, Tom. Thank you, and uh, thanks for being here. What a great crowd. This is really good. Seeing so many newspaper readers in one yes. room is always gratifying. Uh, thanks for being here to talk about the weather. Uh, a lot of people talk about the weather. Nobody does anything about, about it. Yeah. Uh, my favorite weather joke is always George Carlin when he used to do the hippy dippy weatherman, yep. and he'd say, "The forest forecast for tonight is dark." <laughs> Continue dark until tomorrow morning when there'll be scattered light. <clears throat> and that's about as accurate as you can get sometimes in the weather game. Uh, a lot of people in Tucson say, you know, why do we even need weather prediction? It's always sunny and it's always hot. But as we know, and as these pictures that you've been watching as you got ready demonstrate, there are times when the weather just turns on us. Um, and, and these panelists know the effects of that. Some of them are the folks who, who tell you when the weather's going to turn on you, like it did today, when fire blew, when, when the winds blew, the sawmill fire. Uh, I don't know how many miles, probably about five more miles across southern Arizona. Um, and. Um, We also had dust blowing across Interstate 10. Interstate 10 closed at San Simone again. Um, and uh, so the weather has some real ramifications for us in Tucson. And we have a panel that's going to tell you all about what to expect in this coming season and, uh, and tell you a lot of other things about how they predict the weather, um, how they work with the consequences of the weather. And I'm going to introduce the panel from your left to your right. Um, first is Mike Crimmins. Mike is a uh, climate scientist. He uh, works with the cooperative U of A Cooperative Extension Service. And he also does a climate podcast uh, on the Climus website. Uh, so if you ever get a chance to hear uh, Mike and Zach Guido, 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 Zach Guido, they're like the click and clack of the climate bills. Uh, they're very entertaining. Um, next to Mike, uh, Kevin James, uh, Jeans, I asked him before, I said, how do you pronounce your last name? He said, Jeans, like the pants, and I almost introduced him as Kevin Jans. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Jeans is Chief Meteorologist at KOLD-TV. Uh, you've probably seen Kevin wearing a suit and tie, but you've never seen him like this. <laughs> Next to Kevin is Heidi Schul. Um, Heidi spent today in Sonoida oh boy. helping get out information on the sawmill fire. Um, and came here right from Sonoida. I can attest to the fact that she still smells like smoke, uh, but I want you to give her a round of applause for even being here. Next to Heidi is John Gluck. Uh, John is a senior forecaster with the National Weather Service in Tucson. Uh, he is also uh, the, uh, the climate guy. So if you ever read stories in my newspaper and where I very authoritatively tell you that, you know, this is the first march in history that had 17 days over 87 degrees. Um, 
John told me that. Um, John, John is a, a wealth of information, and I think we're going to begin the questioning with John. How this is going to work is I'm going to throw out some questions to these guys and just let them run with them. Um, at the end of an hour, or if they stop talking, I'm going to turn it over to you. So if you have weather questions, Anne will be out there with a the microphone, and you'll be able to ask them. Um, and so an hour of this, a half hour for you to ask questions, and then we're going to stop and go home. Because <laughs> we're old. we got to get our sleep. Uh, and Heidi's had a long day. So, so John, let me let me start with you. Um, this has been an unusual weather year, and maybe they're all unusual. I don't know. Um, we've had high temperatures 10 to 15 degrees above normal for much of the winter. Um, how unusual is that? And and do we have to brace for more record-breaking heat throughout the summer? This one. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Um, thanks, Tom, and thanks for the star for uh, holding this and for you all to show, um, come out tonight. Uh, yeah, the, this March was obviously uh, rather unusual with uh, the streaks of above 85. Closer, 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 closer. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, sorry, but that is my first one. So, so yeah, the March was uh, obviously warm, we all know that, and it, being the warmest March on record, yeah, it was unusual. Uh, the streaks of uh, you know 10 to 15 degrees above normal on high temperatures uh, that hasn't happened in a long time and, and you know prior to probably 1980 it happened once since then you know with the way things have been progressing we've had you know a week or more of those occurrences 39 times and six of that's happened in the last two years so uh, um, yeah it's, it's unusual but it may become usual, who knows, um, the way things are. Um, that's all I have. Okay, we'll, we'll get back to I'm that sure. maybe I'm sure. the wave of the future. Um, Heidi Schul, uh, I'm gonna ask this question the way I originally wrote it, uh, which is sort of outdated now. High heat, low humidity, and wind create perilous conditions for land managers. Are you expecting an active fire year? And are you ready for it? Yes. <laughs> uh, we are expecting, we actually, we're not talking about fire season anymore. We talk about fire year. I was doing some research recently for a story, and I went back as far as January 2016. And the Coronado National Forest has experienced wildfire every month since then. So it's not just a summer phenomenon anymore. We are actively burning, even in the winter months, even when there's storms in the area. So it's no longer a, oh, it's hot and it's dry, I gotta be careful. It's when you put your coat on and go out the door to go out onto your public lands, you still gotta keep your thinking cap on and keep that situational awareness um, up that you don't wanna create a spark. What we're seeing on the Coronado is at the mid to low elevations, we have a huge buildup of dry grasses, tall standing grasses, waist high in places, and those are cured out and ready to go, and they are going right now by Senoida. So um, additionally, um, things are starting to green up, and as it becomes hot and dry, they will also cure out and become fuel for wildfire. So that's what we've got going on down low. Up higher, like on Mount Lennon, there are still patches of snow, and we think, well, fire season will be later up in the mountains, but a couple of weeks ago, we had a fire up in the elevations of Mount Lemon as well. All of these are human caused, which means um, all of them are unnecessary, and we're really pushing the one less spark message, which is don't create the spark that ignites a wildfire. So that includes thinking about what you can do, you know, tying up your toe chains, using an ashtray, not leaving a campfire abandoned for any amount of time because it only takes a second for that spark to get lifted out of the campfire bed and deposit on something dry. So we're really just pushing, um, trying to get people to be aware of what they can do to help prevent wildfires by not causing that spark. Thank you. Kevin. Kevin Jane. Jeans. <laughs> 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 we get, we get 
<laughs> so, so we all like to talk about the weather, and that's a good thing for you because you get to talk about the weather for almost a third of the uh, broadcast nightly, uh, almost. Uh, and, and because it's interesting to people. But sometimes, or most times, it's just interesting. But every now and then, it's life or death. Do you feel like a ramped up sense of responsibility in times like these today, for instance, when, uh, when your job is not just talking about whether it's gonna be sunny or not? Uh, right, I, I think there's, there's a balance there um, between my job when some days we have, say some weeks, we have stretches where the entire week might be 95 degrees and sunny. We, we joke because we're, we're forecasting, all right, do you want to go 93 or 92 tomorrow? Uh, I'll, I'll sit with the other meteorologists and we'll, we'll seriously think about that for way too long. Like, I don't know, I wanted to go 93. Like, Can you throw 92.5? No. <laughs> but then there are times when it gets really active, and that's when it's really fun and exciting for us. But, as you said, it's also dangerous. So, just like I think every meteorologist, we do, uh, we, we like the stormy weather, we like the monsoon. But then we also have to take into account the other factors too. And that's something that I think I, I've learned a lot since I moved here three and a half years ago, when I thought, oh boy, this is gonna be, this is gonna be sunny and, and hot. And in fact, I remember my first, I think 85 degree day, I said it was hot and I got so many emails. <laughs> Dude, if you come in here, it's 85 or So no longer call 85, high is warm. 90's pretty warm. <laughs> But, uh, but we, I mean, we, we watch that and, and, and the simple changes, you know, make a big impact. And uh, winds picking up is a, is a big impact. And going off of kind of what you said earlier too, we, we get a lot of information. We all kind of work together. We get a lot of information from you, Heidi, from you, John. And, and we talk about climate data. And, and we, we all communicate and we get a lot of data from, from both these two. And um, so, in a, in a lot of ways, we are just kind of communicators to say, hey, it's going to be windy. This is a wind advisory that the National Weather Service has issued, or we know it's, that the humidity is going to be really low, uh, that we know fire danger is going to be high. So that part, I mean, uh, I, I think we, we just try to tell everyone and over-communicate what the dangers are. Um, blowing dust, and those are always the, 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 the tough parts, I think, with fire and dust, because you, you really can't predict where that's going to happen. You can only predict the days where there's a higher chance of this happening, but there's no way we could pinpoint on a map and say, hey, that, that's where the dust is going to be today. So all we can do is, is just kind of warn people and tell people ahead of time. Um, but during the monsoon, when actually it becomes, our, we're not going to just sit there and banter for an hour about one degree. This is, is this a serious flood risk that we have tomorrow? Do we need to tell people, all right, maybe plan your day differently tomorrow because if these storms pop up, even though those are difficult to predict where exactly those are gonna pop up too, we get a pretty good idea of when we're gonna have widespread action and widespread monsoon storms. So um, I, I think it, it's tough because it's, it's kind of weird where you, you get excited about active weather, but then you also have to take it back and say, well, this could be really dangerous actually, serious weather or uh, life-threatening weather. And I remember, which I think it was just last year when there were a couple of uh, fatalities when it was 115 degrees out, and they were hikers. And I remember talking to my news director, I was kind of kicking myself, I'm like, I don't get it. You know, we, we, we try, we, we do all this, and, and, we, and you guys try, we, we put all the information out there, and it still happens. And uh, I think that's the weather in all parts of the country. But, um, so, you, I don't know, you gotta stay level-headed. It's exciting, it's fun, but it's also dangerous. So, we try to have fun whenever we do our jobs, but um, at the same time, we also try to, to warn you and, and keep you ahead of changing weather. And, and I'm sure later on there's gonna be some questions about when we're wrong. <laughs> and there's days where, hey, why did you say it was gonna be crazy? It didn't rain in my house at all. I said, well, it, it rained like, 200 feet next to you, and, and that was pretty bad flooding. And uh, so I'm sure that's something we'll, we'll get into a little bit more, but uh, hopefully that, that answers some of your questions. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Mike Crimmins, we have discussions all the time about whether it rained at your house or my house, and, and, and my house is winning. Just to let you know. Um, but, but Mike doesn't just like look at the weather in his house. He looks at the weather globally, 
uh, through data, um, but he also goes out around the state, talks to farmers and ranchers who, who really are attuned with the weather because it's important to their livelihood. Mike, tell us a little bit about uh, the state of the, of, of the rest of the state, the grasslands and the upper elevations. How are things doing this year? State of the state. State of the state. state, of the state. I, I got, I'm still reeling a little bit about 85 degrees. <laughs> I, uh, I, go, I grab a fleece when I run out the door now. <laughs> something seriously wrong uh, with, with someone who thinks 85 is, is on the cooler side. Um, that's living here too long. Um, so the state of Arizona has had a, a, an interest. We've seen it here locally, but it's the, this interesting weather has is, is, uh, been across the entire state. And I was kind of running through some numbers here too. And um, the thing, Tom and I have talked about this quite a bit, but my... Um, expectations for uh, precipitation here in Tucson are so terrible now that um, we can have a, a dry winter will sneak right up, right up on me and I'll, I'll think it's a wet one. And so I was kind of coming into this thinking, oh, it's, it's going to be fun to talk about how wet this winter was. And I went back to the data and it wasn't at all. <laughs> so, um, but the story across the state was a little bit more complicated. Um, if you look at northern Arizona, and you can, you can run a line right through Phoenix. There was a break point right across the state. Um, north of that got um, near average right along that line and everything up north of that got about above average and so that's the October through March totals and most of that was concentrated in uh, December January and the storm track continued to pummel the northern part of the state um, well into February um, but here down here we only really had two average to above average months out of six since October but I, you know, I hadn't seen too many of those in the last uh, 17 years that I've, I've been here, so that completely uh, deluded me into thinking that this was a, a normal wet winter when it wasn't. And so um, the northern part of the state really is doing quite well, um, has had a lot of that um, precipitation, held on to some snowpack at upper elevations, um, even into this part of the season, only the, the peaks are still holding on to that. All the ephemeral snow is gone. Um, you saw a really nice green up of vegetation in response to that uh, wet one, that wet winter, <clears throat> and then the warm up in February March really pushed a lot of that um, phenology or that, that uh, leafing out and flowering and plants pretty quickly into into March. Down here, though, um, it really has been sort of south central southeast Arizona. Um, we uh, lost that storm track in uh, February, and we just held with the heat and got this, we, you know, we're now, in, we're now in the wind. It seems like that that's gonna be the weather that'll be um, with us until the monsoon, most likely. I keep seeing the, um, I got teased by the weather service forecast, uh, John, with the, the 10 to 20% chance of precip on Friday. And I, I, I knew it would go away, so I kept, I kept refreshing and then it went away. And so I just, I felt, <laughs> I felt like the number of these, uh, that, that it did go away. So. Okay, now, I'm done asking you individual questions, and you're going to have to jump on a microphone and respond. All right? Climate data shows that our region is warm in each decade, and all the indices of high temperatures are dominated by the most, 20, most recent 20 years of record. I know this because John has charts that I look at. Uh, is this a trend, and where does it take us from here. Well, we just expect to be warmer. <laughs> the future is warm. Um, it's, I see no reason not, not to go against that. We'll have individual periods where, or months where we'll, we'll be below normal. Um, but for the most part, the trend has been warm and, and the trend in the past has been warm recent past, and the future is just to prepare for warm. Um, How many decades has that been going on? The warming trend for here has probably been since the early 80s, um, or mid 80s. So uh, we've been on, on a slow ramp up, and uh, I see no uh, reason why we should um, change that unless something happens out of our control. <laughs> it's, and it's, I think the, the overnight low temperatures too. I mean, right. When you average them all together, sure, it's been hot in the afternoon, but I think our, our overnights keep on uh, 
getting warmer and warmer. And you look at those records, and it's interesting to look at the last 50 years versus the last 100 years. We don't have any, I mean, there's like a handful of record cold morning temperatures right. in the last 50 years. All of them were from 1900 to 1950. Right. So, I mean, our, our last really big cold snap was February of what, 11? Well, 12, um, yeah. we had 17 and 18. Um, but those are, those are going to be rare. And um, so, it, but, but Kevin's right that, you know, our, our diurnals, uh, which is the difference between low temperature and high temperature, um, haven't really changed much um, over over time. But as we've warmed up with overnight lows, naturally, like it's going to warm up, the result of warmer highs. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, well, maybe we'll set that kind of push on this topic a little bit more. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I, and I think that, John, you, and I hang on, on your data as well. Um, I believe the strongest trends have been in the summer as well. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? I think that we've seen the um, strongest temperature trends in the summertime as well, which is you know, certainly not something you look forward to um, being here in Tucson with summer temps going. Okay, the climate is warming. Does anybody disagree? Not a hand. I love that. Um, <laughs> it, it is fairly evident. And I thought this panel would, would say that um, very, very succinctly. Um, how fully do we understand monsoon patterns? The effect of the El Nino Southern Oscillation and other phenomena that affect our weather. Or, and, and what we're having with those classical patterns, or is it just getting weird? Well, this is funny, because I never want to start talking before John starts talking, so I don't know if you want to take this one or not. Go ahead. Because I've learned a lot from my few short years from, from John's research in, in Climate Info too, but. I think, um, and then it all, you know, just trying to, wrong. <laughs> with, with Enso talking about El Nino and La Nina, it's basically warm waters in the Pacific Ocean or cold waters in the Pacific Ocean, and it has a natural change where it goes from one to the other. And the, uh, the correlation, it just isn't all there. There's kind of a slight hint to where El Nino years would maybe produce more rain. Is that right? I think the correlation is real small, and so there's real, really no direct, okay, it's a La Nina winter, this is what kind of monsoon we're going to have. So it's been, um, it's, it's still very difficult to tell what kind of monsoon we're going to have, really in any year. It's, it's kind of difficult because the, the pattern that we have out here is so unique and different from everywhere else in the country, as you know, obviously. But everywhere else in the country, you have the jet stream, you have a river bear that steers thunderstorms, it can create lift, it can create a vacuum in the atmosphere that creates lift and creates thunderstorms. Those are a lot easier to track because you know where that strong river of air is. Out here, it's just really hot, and then all of a sudden the humidity starts going up, and then that heat, now you get pop-up thunderstorms. And so it's tough to tell where they're all gonna pop up and how many times that's gonna pop up. So what we go by is essentially where uh, the upper high, as we call it, where that is situated basically in a way that can bring in some type of moisture either from the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf of California, the Pacific. So we kind of just go by, all right, when's it humid? It's been hot for a while. All right, storms are gonna be popping up. It's tough to tell, hey, storms are gonna be popping up in Vail, storms are gonna be popping up in Oro Valley. And so those are days where we say, there's a 30% chance of storms. Somewhere. So if you cover up maybe 30% of this map of Southern Arizona, I'd say 30% of those people are gonna be getting rain, but it's, it's, it's almost like, okay, we, we have a pretty solid idea that it, it's gonna be storming. We just don't have a high confidence that every single one of you will happen to get rain. We are having so much fun that we've almost run out of time for this panel. Um, so I, uh, I did want, before we go to questions from the audience, um, I'm sure that everybody here, Heidi, would like to know what's going on down south with the sawmill fire. Can you give us a report on that? 
Yes, so the sawmill fire started on Sunday, and it started on land managed by the, Air, by the state of Arizona, and they threw a lot of resources at it, and thought we had it caught, they had it caught, and then there was what we call a slop over, where it crossed the line, and we were off to the races. So now it has burned onto the Coronado National Forest, and either has or will soon burn onto Bureau of Land Management land as well. So we're using what we have a un what we call a unified command system, where we're all cooperating, and um, so the fire's estimated at about between 17 and 20,000 acres now. That's based on a visual estimate, so a lot of times we'll give a fire acreage and the next day it shrinks, it's smaller. That's because we mapped it the second day, so a lot of times when we just kind of look at it and kind of guess, you know, make an estimate on our best experience, um, that's what we're doing with this one. So 17 to 20,000 acres, expecting more growth out of it. It's burning in grassland, which um, there's that tall dry grass I was talking about. When you get wind with that grass, it can really push a fire quickly. It can push it in different directions. So that's what we're seeing happen. Um, the fire was up in some mountainous areas also for a while. And there are three things that will cause what we call fire behavior. That's how the fire burns. And that's fuels, weather, and topography. So the fuels there are the grass. Uh, the weather is there, the wind, and it's not even that hot yet, um, but when some of those winds aligned with the top topography, like alongside, along canyons or chutes or something like that, that really accelerates things. So we're seeing a lot of movement with the fire. You know, this fire is in grassland, and I want to say all fire isn't bad. Fire is a great recycler. It returns nutrients to the soil, but when we have things like power lines and people's homes and ranchettes and so forth, that changes the equation. So we've got close to 300 people, probably now with this uh, incident management team that came on, we've got over 300 people working, like 20 some fire engines, a lot of aircraft, a bunch of fire crews. So we're throwing a lot of resources at this. It's that dang wind that just makes everything so doggone hard. Okay, thank you. And I was mystified that we had gone through an hour so quickly. We had, it was half an hour. Um, we, we started at 6.30, didn't we? Yes. Okay, never mind. <laughs> so we have time for more questions from me, but we'll, we'll save a lot of time for you to ask questions as well. Um, I wanna know, when's it gonna turn 100 in Tucson. Not that, not that that means anything. I mean, it was 97 the other day. What's the difference between that and 100? But, you know, we want to know when it's going to hit 100. And I also want to know whether we're going to have a good monsoon this year. So who wants to tell me that? <laughs> Well, Hunter's not going to happen in April, that's for sure. Um, uh, it's most likely going to happen in, in uh, May, and I cross fingers it could happen in June, but uh, most likely in May. Um, looking at the, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm, work, I'm, I'm working um, this week, so I'm working midnight, so I go from here to work. Um, so the, the latest models don't see, there's not 100 in the forecast the next 10 days, so. Um, I can't pinpoint a day in May, but it's probably going to be after the, you know, the middle of the latter part. And, and the average is May 26, but that's the historical average. Obviously, that um, has a lot of uh, early days in there, and we may have to change our baseline in the future a little bit um, because of the way things have been warming to have a different average day instead of historical. Um, and we do communicate that out um, with our charts of, you know, our average day since such and such year. Um, now with the monsoon, um, that's a whole that's that's a big question in the sky. Um, I, I this is going to be my 23rd monsoon. I've been here since '95, um, and I always say normal <laughs> so, because because it, it, like. One person on, you know, on, the, on one side of the street can get a lot of rain, you know, a mile away, they get less. So, and everybody always complains about the airport being on the wrong spot in town. Um, and having the lowest precept of every place. I go, but it's there for aviation purposes. And, and, but we, 
you know, we do use other data that's um, precip data um, via, um, you know, Pima County Flood Control District, um, rain log um, people. Um, that's really been very beneficial over the last uh, 10 years to see even rain patterns on a, on a, on a, a week to a more day-to-day -day basis. Um, so, uh, you know, the computer, latest computer models are indicating that we may see potential false months in, probably in late May, maybe June. And, um, but with the, with the snowpack and the Rockies and a lack of drought in the plains, that, that may retard the high from getting into the, our normal spot. So we may see these little, little fall starts. Um, and I would, I would say that, you know, the average day is July 3rd. Um, so I would gather that be around probably a little bit after that. So, um, but that's my early guess. Um, we, haven't, we haven't come out with a forecast yet. We're gonna probably do that in June when we have our monsoon awareness week. Um, that leads up right into the start of the monsoon. Um, and I will probably put that on our website, uh, a YouTube video and, and such like that. And we'll have another a month and a half of computer runs to look at, see if things change. For the record, the airport, let's say, was in your backyard and then it was in your backyard for the entire time that we kept records there. That's going to be up and down too. So the uh, so it's always funny to say, oh, the airport, you know, but we, we like, John just said there are uh, several stations or a lot of people who have stations at their house that they hook up to the network that we can see and so we'll still show what Oro Valley got or uh, what other parts of town got not just the airport but it's just so happened that airport and it's just been the same location for how many years same location and the airport's been at 48 so you got to stay with the same spot and then that's how you, you yeah. keep your constant uh, data coming in but um, it's funny looking at climate prediction center which is a service they, they'll send out graphs for the next two weeks, the next month, the next three month, uh, three months, and they'll, they'll give you a percentage of the chance of it above average or below average. So it's a 30% a chance of it being above the average, or a 30% chance of it being below the average. A lot of times, it seems to me that at least, they put Arizona in this EC, which is equal chance which is like beyond 50 50. To me, it's like, yeah, yeah, maybe, could. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's, yeah, it, it's all this stuff. So, um, so looking at some of the, um, the long range forecast models today, too, and the seasonal, um, I, I do think the official forecast right now is equal chances for the, the summer. I think that's right. I, I didn't, I didn't yes. see any other. I think it's, it's just white. So, um, one thing that I thought was kind of interesting in, in some of the uh, East Pacific sea surface temperatures, though, is it looks like the East Pacific is going to be warm again um, for the third year in a row, uh, which could be part of maybe some of the signal coming up of um, uh, early season tropical storm activity that we've seen in the last couple of summers. Again, it's very early, um, but there has been some research published in the last year or two that really does show that this very warm water that's extending now from the coast of South America all the way up into the uh, coast of Baja, California, does induce and support a lot of these um, strong East Pacific uh, hurricanes. And that's a fairly new pattern that we've seen in, like, in the last couple of years, whereas even six, seven, eight years ago, we were, that was very cold water and we weren't dealing with that kind of storm activity. So I do think that that's a, kind of an interesting feature to maybe watch for this particular monsoon season that has been at play in the last couple of years. Let's talk about warnings and, and being prepared. It looks like, as usual, the next couple months are going to be hot and dry and maybe windy. Uh, the weather we've been having this past week, um, which you weather guys can correct me if I'm wrong, results when the storm track is just sort of sitting north of us and we get wind but no precipitation and that is a recipe for disaster some years. I remember the year 2011 when more than a million acres burned in Arizona and part of it was that we were dry and there was a lot of fuel 
but, uh, but the biggest part of it is that uh, your colleague Chuck Maxwell over in New Mexico, meteorologist with the uh, Forest Service there, called it gravel blowing wind. We had wind after wind after wind, and we had the monument fire in Sierra Vista, where it blew out of the canyons and across the highway. We had the Horseshoe Two fire in the Chiricahuas that burned across the entire range, up and over the ridges. And we had the Wallow fire, the biggest fire in our history. Um, are we in for something like that this summer? <laughs> On the fire side, as long as Mother Nature and uh, and uh, the public don't do anything dumb, we're fine. <laughs> I mean, we're most of the time we pretty much most of the time we're in fire, you know, high fire danger, depending on what being 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 the grass we got grasses now, or or we've had an extended dry period where it's impacting you know all the elevations. Um, but as long as Mother Nature and the public don't start, you know. Light one, we're fine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's a very big if. If, that's the big if, right. So, uh, um, now, to, to say we're going to, you know, we, we can't predict that, uh, how big a fire is going to get or when a fire is going to go. We, all we can do is, is, is you know, on, on Heidi's side, is, is to deal with, you know, educating the public. That's the biggest thing on, on everything is educating the public on being fire wise. Um, being weather-wise, de dealing with, with heat, um, and when we get to the monsoon, dealing with flooding issues. Um, it's, it's the education part. Um, once we put out a forecast or, or a warning, and, and then um, you know, Kevin on his end, he transmits that warning out, um, it's up to the public to do, decide what to do. Um, so we, we, we are part of it, and then how the general public deals with it, that's, that's their choice. Take the bait a little bit on the, the, the forecast side. This is the most famous last words. The, the 2011 um, spring, I don't think we're headed for a repeat with the climate pattern. That was a really unusual spring. It was a lot, it was a strong La Nina year. Um, if you remember that, that was sort of the, the kickoff to the Texas and New Mexico drought. Um, we had a, an interesting pattern where the northern, I always get this backwards. I believe the northern part of the state did fairly well with snowpack and then we dried out. So it's similar in that pattern, but the, um, in April and May we had a very strong um, cold trough that set up over the western U.S. and just hung out there. It just it literally just spun. And as the subtropical high tries to push north, as the sun angle gets higher, it was just battling with that. And so we had this exceptionally strong wind uh, pattern that just persisted for day after day. And you could just, it was, I hadn't seen anything it was remarkable, and you can see the the tracks of those fires were in these long, narrow corridors um, with the prevailing winds. the The pattern that I've seen so far is it's been fairly progressive, right? We haven't seemed to have gotten stuck. Um, this uh, right now is sort of moving through quickly. We'll ridge again. Um, <laughs> anything's possible, though, with weather, right? <laughs> um, could this happen in May? Sure. I I do think, though, then when we looked back and tried to to sort that out, it was part of um, two research studies to try to figure that out. It, it did seem like the La Nina was one of the, um, the driving mechanisms for that pattern. And we're, we're, um, we're fading out of a weak La Nina right now, and we're neutral, we're, we're leaning towards an El Nino right now. So that, that would be the one thing that would, would be the flying ointment, thankfully, that that pattern wouldn't repeat this this. Let, let's talk about warnings and predictions for extreme weather. Um, fires, you don't know when they're going to break out. Um, dust storms, you sort of know when it's going to blow hard enough to make that dust airborne. You don't know exactly where, although we have some usual suspects. <laughs> And, and John, I know that the Weather Service has been working with a lot of other agencies to try and pinpoint that a little bit better than in the past. Could you talk a little bit about that? You're gonna have some more pinpoint warnings this year? Well, with, uh, you know, this has become obviously a big issue in the last 10 years. 
um, especially uh, during the monsoon. With uh, we I see more frequent abuse. Um, the storms headed out up from here up to Phoenix versus when I first arrived here in the night in the mid to late nineties. Um, so you know we 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 become we become better to um, you know recognize certain patterns that will lead to um, dust events. Obviously, the stuff that's been happening recently last year over on in eastern Cochise County. Long I-10 is obviously was, you know, more man-made event because what, what happened with uh, the agriculture there. Um, but, you know, there are some now with overall um, to trying to deal with uh, you know, warnings for dust. Um, you know, we got sensors now along I-10 um, that helps us out a little bit. Um, and I, 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 you know, I can't remember what all came out of the dust workshop from a couple months ago. Um, but we are getting better at recognizing things. Um, we've gotten better at um, putting out better, longer lead time for dust advisories than we did 10 years ago, probably five years ago. Um, again, it's all on pattern recognition and, and dealing with whatever the soil conditions are also. Um, you know, obviously the hotter it is, the warmer it is, the drier it is, the easier it is for dust to get airborne. Um, so. And when I got up this morning, the National Weather Service had a wind advisory and it warned of blowing dust in the San Simone area. It had an arrow pointing to everybody's favorite farm. Uh, and, and it said that, that there was a danger of, of low visibility due to blowing dust between 10 a.m. and 8 p.m. At 10 a.m., I looked at my Twitter feed and uh, uh, the Department of Public Safety and the Department of Transportation had shut it down once again, and people were detouring through Safford to Lordsburg, 110 miles, instead of going past a land that one farmer decided to blade. And, uh, and, and we've, we've, because of what happened last year, we've um, been partnered with, uh, with um, DPS and, and, and giving them more of a specialized forecast for that area, and, um, and just so they get a, a better idea um, what what could occur um, instead of just a general forecast for it in areas so it's it's more specialized and from because uh, we, we meet every year in multiple agencies about a, about dust we meet uh, have a, a dust workshop talk about what, what can be done what's happened some stats and uh, I don't remember if it was ADOT or DPS but somebody gave that a statistic that really there was only a I think it was basically a 10 mile stretch where there were, and don't quote me on the exact number, but I mean it was over 100 collisions going back over the last 10 years, it was really a 10 mile stretch, and then they, they had it narrowed down to uh, about 50 out of that 100 or so were within like a one, it wasn't even one, it was 0.8. So the little mile corridor, they know, okay, this is a trouble spot, and so I know there's a lot of things in the works, or just at least a discussion out there of, what can be done? So, as John mentioned, dust sensors are uh, likely going out there, and um, or more of them going out there, and maybe some more signs that could give us advanced warnings. So as you're driving, and you see, hey, okay, I know that there is dust coming up here, rather than you're driving, and all of a sudden the visibility drops. So, it, and it's a little bit more difficult, especially near San Simone and in Cochise County, than it is up closer to Chandler and past Casa Grande and Eloy where, as you said, you get dust storms or big haboobs that you see these huge towering walls of dust. Okay, I know dust is coming, but whenever we, we get just kind of that southwest wind, you get little channels of dust, and that's when you're driving, and that's whenever it causes the most collisions, because you don't see it coming, all of a sudden the visibility drops. So that's the toughest part, and I think the biggest battle right now is to try to detect that kind of dust, and if we can have sensors in the right locations, then we can <coughs> give at least advanced warnings while people are driving. Um, and the other part is, too, I don't know if John, you want to go into detail about the, just the warning system, polygon kind of that. Well, right now the dust dust are not going to polygon, um, so we can specify a certain area and then potentially down the road if you're driving, that that warning can come to you on your phone. Um, some some um, um, warnings now are coming down to your phone. I, I think that's not supposed to be added this year. I can't remember. Um, but you know the, the polygon. More often than not, with 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 a warning, um, we've gotten to the point where we can specialize a certain area. Um, 
but on certain, sometimes it doesn't show up like that on the map. It shows a little more on the map um, than, than area cover wise. Um, but um, the the warning the warning issue is, is is the hard part of trying to communicate that out. Again, we do our best, um, and then it, it comes down to the, our partners, the media, and the, the push, push that out too. Okay, so to recap what we've learned so far, John says it's going to hit 100 on May 10th, I believe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> At 2.52. At 2.52 p.m., which is a little early in the afternoon, actually, isn't it? The average is about 1.40, about 1.45. See, this is why he's the expert. <laughs> and the monsoon is going to start July 5th. Okay. Or well, shortly the, after July 4th, I believe he said. Well, that it, it depends on what definition you use. Uh huh. And, and Mike, Mike has told us that it's not going to be a really bad fire year. It's not going to be like 2011, he said, because the wind isn't setting up exactly like that. So thanks. For that. I am happy to hear that. Um, and, and Heidi, Heidi says, you know, we won't have fires unless we make sparks. And I'm sure that nobody here in this room is going to go out and start a fire. Um, but please tell your friends and neighbors that, you know, it's really dangerous out there. And one less spark would be a, a really good thing to practice this year. Um, we are at that point where we can take questions from the audience. And so I know all of you are going, look at those hands. What, a, what an engaged crowd. So Anne is going to come and, uh, and you can direct your question to somebody in particular or you can just throw it out to the panel. Oh, my name is Larry. Uh, I live about five minutes away from here. Uh, I used to live in Chicago and all the weather came from one direction. So I'm curious from uh, the panel's point of view, what, what is the major source of the weather here in Tucson? Is it the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf of California, or the Pacific? Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, well, outside the monsoon, obviously everything goes west, west to east. Um, and uh, with our winter storms coming down the California coast, they drop down here and then they move out into the plains and then the east coast. The, with, um, with the monsoon, uh, everything changes. You know, monsoon means change of wind for the most part, and uh, um, with the high setting up to our east, our flow comes out of the south and southeast. So we do have different moisture sources. Um, you know, we'll get some from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, for our big events, we really want to moisten up the low parts of the atmosphere as the Gulf of California. Um, and again, that we monitor that depending on how the pressure differences are between, you know, the northern part of the Gulf of California and then the southern part. To see if there's going to be a strong Gulf surge or not. Um, you know, thunderstorm activity in Sonora off to uh, Sierra Madres that push out outflows, um, which will also increase moisture. So, um, for the most part, especially if we're just talking about soon, it's the Gulf of Mexico and the Gulf of California. It was Gulf of California being playing, be more of a player. I think to adding to that too, we have very, very light upper level winds. So, in the monsoon, you get these big thunderstorms you don't necessarily know which direction they're going to go. They're going to collapse, and then that outflow is going to go and kick up another storm, and it could virtually be in any direction. So during the monsoon, you're almost, you can almost never track one storm and watch it go from one direction to another. It's going to collapse, and then a new one's going to pop up. I, I consider our thunderstorms Pac-Man. <laughs> <laughs> they're looking, constantly looking for moisture. So, and, and they're, con like Kevin said, they'll, they'll, they'll one, one storm will move to the east, another storm will move to the south, they'll, they'll go all over the place because they're looking for moisture. And uh, to need something to eat upon um, to sustain itself. If not, then they die. Really appreciate you being here. Um, I have tons of questions, but I'll just ask one. Uh, I get very frustrated. This is mostly directed maybe for Heidi and Kevin and you. The uh, media, the media, and the um, fire people I would really love to see a coordination where maps were produced and 
you know, I'm sure that there are maps somewhere about where fires are happening, but it seems they're really hard to find. And um, my question is, why isn't the media putting out maps so that we know where the fires are actually hitting? And, you know, that just would be helpful. Um, Thank you, that's Tom. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I know there, there are, I mean, obviously there are plenty of maps, and, and we usually, within our stories, I know at least publish out the links to where those are because, and I don't even know, I mean, you, you can clearly speak more about the origin of the maps in, in AT Web or, or Wildcat, but um, in my, at least in the weather reports, I try to point out, here's what fire I'm talking about, just did it today, here's what it is. But in terms of the maps, with all the information, and we usually provide links to that during our stories, and a lot of that's through reporters, but as far as the origin of the maps, I don't know if, if you want to handle this. Okay, so when we get small fires, and we respond, that's called initial attack, and a lot of those we pick up pretty quickly, so maps aren't generated. Um, if things escalate and we're looking at more of a long campaign, then if it's on the forest, then we'll try to generate some maps in-house, and those will go up on NCWeb, which is like the one-stop shop for fire information, and they'll also go on our Facebook page um, once those are generated and we can get them. Now, when we have an incident management team come in, like we just had today, they have a GIS shop and everything else, so they're going to start generating maps, and they may start their own Facebook site. Um, they may send those uh, maps out and attach them to news releases. They're gonna be sending out twice a day updates. And so when we send stuff out, it's up to whoever whether they wanna publish that or not. We can put it on our on what we control, which is our Facebook page, and we can tweet it um, in the NCWeb. So speaking for the Arizona Daily Star, we love maps. We love to show you where the fire is. We like to publish them at least on our web page, if not in the paper itself. A fire like the one that's burning right now, um, it popped up. Uh, there are maps that show it as a little bitty flame somewhere north of Madeira Canyon. Um, that's, that's not where it is anymore. Um, it has blown you know, 10 miles to the east, and, and there's still flames over there, but, but nobody has yet produced a map, um, and we're not capable of figuring that out ourselves. Um, and any, any information that we gave you uh, would be wrong tomorrow. Uh, as Heidi said, there is a type two incident management team that's coming in to take over. They have the GIS capability, They'll fly that tonight, and I assume there'll be a map tomorrow, and then on subsequent days, they'll have those nice maps that show you, you know, where the fire boundary was today, and how much it grew the next day, and the next day, and, uh, and we'll put those up as soon as we get them. So what's the site? I'm sorry. What's... Oh, I'm sorry. There's, N NCWeb is the shorthand for it's, so if you just go to ncweb.nwcg.org, that's where information gets put up about all fires nationwide, all agencies. And if you don't remember, just Google NCWeb. Yeah, Google NCWeb. NCI web. Web, and you'll find um, Either for John or Mike, is there some sort of convention for moving the average with both temperatures and precip as time goes on. I know you use historical averages, but history keeps going. So is our average for highs or average highs actually moving up as we progress through time? You can give the official party line, Tom, I think. <laughs> well, we, we, run, we use 30-year normals, and they're calculated every 10 years. Um, so right now we're in a 1981, 2010 normals, and the 91, 20, 2020 normals will come out in 2022 or 2021. Um, so that's what we're, that's our base. Um, and for our, our our highs, yes, they 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 are working their way up, and um, um, we got awfully close to 117 last year when we hit 115. Are we going to become like Phoenix? No, um, where we hit one, they hit 120s regularly. Um, but I can see us obviously, considering due to the heat island effect that we have in town, and we're starting off warmer, 
that naturally that's going to make us be warmer down to uh, with high temperatures. Um, so, you know, we, 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 we've had a couple periods recently in the last 10, 15 years where we've had long stretches of 100 degrees. I think the record's 39. And um, so I can see us having a couple of those periods um, down the road. Um, you can't say we can't break it. I'm not going to say we're not going to break 117 either. Um, but that would that would have that would have to be one um, big event. We got close last year, um, but the trend is to go warmer, and and I, I see no reason to to go away with that. Um, it's just now, how do we as 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 a society deal with a warmer planet? Um, so, and that's an individual basis. Before you all started, I just wanted to quick go back. I goofed. It's not insuweb.org. It's insuweb.gov. But if you go Google it, you're good. Before you started, they showed pictures of Marina underwater. And there was more than one picture. Is Marina always going to be underwater? <laughs> So those were photos of Marana from the 1983 flood um, when the Santa Cruz River overflowed its banks in Marana. Um, they now have a levee. Um, and, and most of those flooding pictures that you saw from 1983 occurred before Pima County uh, stabilized the banks of the Rito and the Pantano and the Santa Cruz River through Tucson all the way north into Marana. So that type of flooding is, uh, is not going to happen again unless we have uh, much more severe flooding than they anticipated or unless, you know, a levee breaks or, you know, a, a channel gets formed where it wasn't before. Uh, but mostly that was a consequence of people building in floodplain um, and, and not realizing that, uh, you know, those hundred year floods do come every hundred years and sometimes every 10 years. Uh, hi, my name is Gino Zampini. Um, do you think we have uh, in the future close a tornado in Arizona? Tornado. 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 Tornadoes in Arizona. Do we have? Do we have? Are we expected to see more? Is it yes. Yes. Expectation is more. Don, you wanna? That's hard. You know, we do have a handful of tornadoes. They're usually, um, you know, sure. very small ones. Um, I, it, it all depends on what the atmospheric conditions are. The, mon the monsoon. There, it's hard to get in the monsoon because we don't have enough wind to get things going. Like Kevin said earlier, we have light winds pretty much all the way up into the atmosphere where the storms have really nowhere to do. It's too, um, they, can't, they don't have uh, anywhere to move. And unless we get a, um, a, a low pressure system that comes in um, that can spin, spin one up, um, or, or there's, 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 some, there's another mechanism that's, that's going on, but we need, you need wind to spin something up, and, and the change of direction in the wind also is higher you go up to uh, get a tornado going. Um, we haven't had a, a big one here since the 70s, I think, with San Javier that uh, got hit. But Flagstaff has a little more chance of seeing one than we do because um, they're probably a little closer to a storm, to a storm track up there. Just to, to jump on that too, with the, uh, as far as the climate projections uh, for the Southwest 2, looking for a, a pattern that would be favorable for tornado development, you, we just don't see that developing into anything more than what we would have right now. So I think the, the chance um, ones that can occur in the springtime, again, you have to have moisture to actually do it, which is difficult. We seem to be seeing less in the spring. And then the chance ones that occur during the monsoon uh, system are typically very, very weak. Um, and so I, I, I don't see that as a, an increasing threat for the Southwest. I have a question. You have, here I am. You have told us that Tucson is getting progressively warmer and you anticipate that trend will continue. Has it also been getting progressively drier and importantly do you anticipate that will continue? Yes. 
that in other words, Tucson will continue to get drier and drier in the future? So the, the trends that we see in the observational record are, are as, as John and Kevin, everyone on this panel have said, is that it's getting warmer. It's just very evident at all scales across Southwest observational data. Um, and as we look into the future, the expectations will continue to get warmer. Um, when we look at the observational record as far as precipitation, we don't see any discernible trends. We're, um, uh, we're a region built for variability. Uh, and we're largely tied to El Nino Southern Oscillation for wintertime variability, and then we just have weather occurring during the monsoon season. So we are in a really interesting spot as far as um, having these two different seasons to kind of sometimes balance each other out. Not always. <laughs> sometimes we fall flat with both winter and summer. Sometimes winter picks up a bit of the slack. And as the winter, we've seen that in the last couple of years with the summers, depending on where you're at, Tom's house is always wider than mine, <laughs> don't know why, um, is that you, you see this sort of as you average out to the, the year total, um, we actually haven't been doing too terribly bad in the last couple of years. Okay, so this is again a sort of seasonal variability all the way to what we call decadal variability. So the climate models suggest that this decadal variability will continue. So we'll continue to have wet cycles and dry cycles, but as it warms at the same time. The trick with that is, is that um, as it warms, we have more atmospheric demand uh, on all of the systems, including water resources and plants and, and all of our systems. And that atmospheric demand uh, takes more of that water that's occurring through that naturally occurring precipitation and pulls it into the atmosphere. So we see this, this drying signal so really because of increasing temperatures going forward in the future. Again, is that, it's, it's not a slam dunk because we will still have wet summers, but they'll be hot wet summers and we'll have hot, dry springs, and we'll have warm, wet winters, and then we'll have warm, dry winters. So how that actually plays out in the water balance in the future is, is not totally clear, but definitely leans towards drier for uh, here in the Southwest. And actually, I'll just add to that real quick, just to, um, I don't know, though, maybe a lot of you guys know this already, but in terms of helping out our drought, it's really not the monsoon that does it. We get a lot of rain in a really short, quick period of time, but it's the rain during the winter months that lasts longer, that, that allows the ground to, to soak in all that water. The monsoon rain isn't that big of a help. It helps, sure, but you see all the, the rushing water that's, that's flying down the washes and the rivers. That's water that's not getting absorbed by the ground as easily. So um, in terms of getting better rain for uh, getting uh, Lower in the drought, then that's for that's winter storms that we we really want to get more. My question uh, centers around uh, computer models. You mentioned that earlier in the discussion. My question centers around how many computer models are in existence, and uh, of those, how many do you concentrate, or which ones do you concentrate for Tucson? Um, Dr. Short-term or climate models, because they're two different ones. Because yeah. he can answer the climate model and I can answer the short-term. Yeah. Oh. Go. Go. Well, <laughs> we have lots of them. Okay. <laughs> um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a day like tonight when, I'm, when I go to work, I'll look at a probably um, six or seven. Um, plus ensemble models, which is uh, um, uh, a, a certain model that's run um, 10, 20, 30 times with, di with different parameters. And then that sometimes does a better job because you can get a mean out of that and get a better forecast than basically just off one model. Um, as Mike said earlier, about the 10 to 20% chance on Friday. Um, I didn't have that in the forecast on when they come no, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just, just getting to get to the point of, yeah. I, I, I didn't see that in, in the forecast because the ensembles weren't doing that, but then the next run of models were indicating potential moisture getting a little further west, then we started to add that in the forecast. The next model run took that back out. So it's kind of a yo-yo effect we try to avoid, um, but we, we have, you know, lots of models to look at. Now during the come monsoon um, time, uh, we can get kind of uh, high res resolution models 
which we can get hourly data, which the U, U of A runs, um, be taken off the, G, the GFS the, and a couple other models. And we look at that and they, and they come up with a different, better forecast um, or a different forecast. And we'll look at that, especially trying to um, determine where the thunderstorm is going to be initiating and where they're going to be moving. Um, and so that's more of a short-term forecast, because once you get into the monsoon, um, it, the hardest part is dealing with the next six to 12 hours. Um, what's going to, and, and that will impact the next day. What happens day three, four, five, six, and seven is basically climatology. Um, 20, 30, 40% chance of afternoon and evening showers and thunderstorms. It's the first. It's the first day. That's the hard part. And like Kevin said earlier, we don't know most of the time where they're going to generate and where they're going to go, because um, you, you can see. I, it's always fascinating me where where the Catalinas will light up and not one storm will be on the Rincons. And you're going why? I mean, they're pretty much the same elevation. They should be running off the same kind of moisture profile. But one mountain's dead, the other one's lit up. I still haven't been able to figure that out. Um, so that's the hard part. So on the um, kind of moving from um, John's scale of the forecaster, um, and a, a scale that we both look at is the sort of seasonal uh, climate modeling, um, the seasonal climate models that are out there. Are there's probably about I think there's ten in the multi-model ensembles. So there's an international multi-model ensemble sort of coordinated system, and there's a national one. So the national one is a, a series of um, uh, global forecast models that are run by different, actually, agencies within the U.S. government and also university uh, groups. And they're, they're run, some of them are run every day, some are run several times a day, some are run every month, and then they're sort of grouped together to give you um, what we call an ensemble, which is basically taking all, an ensemble of opportunity, taking all of this modeling data and just sort of averaging it together. So the idea is, is that everybody's got something wrong, and the hope, the hopefully, is that they cancel each other out, and the rightest answer comes out. <laughs> it's hey, that's where we're at. I mean, and, and that's good. I mean, this is remarkable what we're able to do with the computing power we're able to do. Um, these these models are very cruel emotionally um, because you can see them update uh, several times a day with some of them, the climate forecast system out of out of NOAA, uh, all the way out to 13 months. So you can you can play with the idea of what's it gonna, what's it gonna, what's the amount of rain that's gonna happen next December? And you can watch it sort of go from wet to dry to wet to dry to wet to dry over a series of days. And so um, that's not as good for you emotionally probably if you're counting on that. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, there are times when these models can be very useful and there's times when these models are known to not perform very well. And one of them was this curveball El Nino of 2015-2016, uh, uh, which I held high hopes was going to give us one of these record wet winners, and the forecast models um, basically led me by the nose with this idea because they all sort of bat on and across the board on this very wet signal, and um, they were wrong. <clears throat> um, they were right for a very short period of time and then wrong for a very long period of time, and on average were wrong. So um, there's still a lot of work to be done. They're very good at temperature because temperature is fairly easy to get at these broad, these broad scales. So that's at the seasonal. Now when we get up to climate projections where we're going out to 100 years or even further, we can have dozens of agency university models across the world that are run for 100, 150, 200 years. And those, those particular modeling outputs can take months just to come up with um, a projection. Again, those are not forecasts. There's scenario-based projections to give you a feel for based on trajectories and greenhouse gases and changes in land cover and, and the ocean ocean patterns. Um, what might happen given starting at this point, kind of running up in the future? Um, I wrote an article this morning um, published by the University of Arizona that said that uh, Tucson now gets 47 extreme weather events annually, and that that is considerably more than any other city in the West, including Austin, Las Vegas, Phoenix, Portland, San Diego. And they talked about certain implications of that, but they didn't really explain, or not in a way that I understood, why is it that Tucson gets more extreme weather events? So the report that you're talking about was published uh, on, on the uh, MAP program 
um, that is run out of the Eller College of Management at the University of Arizona. And I, I don't know if any of you have seen that report yet. I just looked at it briefly myself. Um, and, and when it talked about extreme weather, uh, it, it was counting any thunderstorm that produced damage. Um, and in aggregate, um, all of those, that thunderstorm damage was, was a small part of the overall weather damage. Most of the weather damage they talk about in that report was from fires. Um, and so I, I, I think the only thing you can draw from that is that uh, we get a lot of thunderstorms with, you know, downdrafts that, that, you know, blow shingles off roofs or knock trees over that people file insurance claims on. Um, and, but it's not, I, I didn't read that to mean like we have really vicious weather here. It's just that there are more incidents of that. We get a lot of thunderstorms here. Uh, yes, um, mentioned the heat island effect briefly. I can remember we left in the mid 80s. One of the things I remember about monsoon then was the palpable approach of a monsoon, the smell of the rain. We, you know, we were gone 30 years. How much has that changed in the 30 years here in Tucson? Has it really increased that much? Increased. You, you're talking about just the... The heat island effect. Heat island. Oh, the heat island effect. Yes. There's still, there's still a question. Well, <laughs> oh, no, it, I, it, to, it was... <laughs> you mentioned heat island. I'm just talking about the fact that you could actually feel the monsoon approaching that. Been back here about a year and a half now, and I didn't notice that. Does the heat island effect really increase that much? That uh, rain is not getting into town? That it's evaporating like it does in Phoenix? Well, the one thing that we have that Phoenix doesn't have, at least we have two mountain ranges right near us. That helps when the storms go off, depending on wind flow, that'll get into town. Um, the one, thing, the one thing I've noticed since, since I've been here, this 23 years, is um, um, the lightning displays are not as great as they were. Um, when I first got here in the mid-90s, just seeing lightning just you know, cascade across the sky was just fascinating to me because I, I grew up in the Midwest and cloud cover is like down here and you can see that, whereas our clouds are above the mountains here. Um, so. Now the heat island obviously maybe changed to maybe circulations and how the how the, the storms get in. You know, I don't know. Again, it's it's a it's a it's it's a perception I think that that, that people have on what happened in the past and what's going on in the future. Um, that to me that's what it is, and and perception on how a monsoon behaves too. Um, you know, you may think that um, you know. You're, you're not seeing a lot of monsoon. You know, we get a lot of calls saying, well, what happened to the monsoon? We had parts of the state, part of our area is getting hammered like, like, like crazy. Um, it just depends on, on where you're at. And, and that's a perception thing in my mind. Um, Do you guys get the same question? Well, 30 years ago, it used to be 145 or 146, and I look at my watch, and then it'd be storming right now. It right. doesn't do that anymore. Right. We get that question so much, and that, I think, is, again, another myth. Yes. Uh, and maybe there's a lot that could go into that. And maybe it's just we have more cameras readily available and you're seeing more rain and stuff like that. I don't know, but uh, but that is another myth. I have to throw that in there too. Yeah, I, I, I give a monsoon talk every year to the to the AMS chapter, um, Southeast Arizona AMS chapter. Um, and that was one of the first kind of questions we got the first couple of years was, well, it's like clockwork, back in the day, Thunderstorms pop up the mountain, two o'clock, it rolled through my house at 3.30. Atmosphere doesn't work that way. <laughs> no, no. Hi there. Um, first of all, I'm from uh, Operational Weather Squadron here, located at Davis Mothin Air Force Base. Uh, many in the crowd may not know it, but the military's west coast and western half of the United States is forecasted right here locally in Tucson. Uh, so first of all, to extend an invitation to anyone on the panel to come and check us out. 
and vice versa, especially if you want to talk about dust. We have some Middle Eastern specialists uh, listening through trial and error. Uh, I do have one actual question, and that is, as far as water conservation in the monsoon season, what is your interaction with the local um, engineers uh, to capture any of some of that rainfall, and whether or not that you see that going forward as we continue to warm and dry? And the second one is to open an ongoing beer bet on that 100 degree temperature mark. <laughs> 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 I think it's yours. You got the beer bet anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I can do the water art. You, you do the water art. Okay, thank you. So um, on the, the water harvesting idea, I, I you know that's that's a, a really old, really old, thousands of years old idea that's that's um, come around again because it's such a good idea. And um, Tucson is really leading the way in a lot of respects as far as um, city ordinances, the encouragement of um, curb cuts and um, home installations, and even you know thinking pretty innovatively on what we actually do with stormwater rather than just trying to get rid of it and move it as quickly out of town as possible. How can we actually try to use it to possibly infiltrate, to save, to use? Um, I think that. I think that that is the future in a, in a drying climate because the monsoon will continue into the future. Um, it's it's going to be a great water source for us to use. We have some um, engineering challenges to try to understand and work through, but I, I do think we're on the right track with that. And I think that's pretty exciting. And I think we'll do some of the leader. Um, you know, we're learning from uh, the Middle East on some of this technology because it's been around for thousands of years, and we will innovate and we'll be able to teach others as we uh, move forward. <laughs> Uh, hello, thank you for coming. I could ask you a million questions, but I'm just going to ask you two. Um, the first one is, I've read, correct me if I'm wrong, that some of the deserts in the world have reached record-breaking temperatures, just not seasonal, but global record-breaking temperatures. And I'm wondering if our desert is going to keep progressing towards seeing really, truly off-the-chart temperatures. And the second one, question I have is um, do you recommend the use of the NOAA weather band radio for alerts? Well I do on the, on for NOAA weather radio yeah obviously I'm going to push that um, but also you, the, the technology is there you get stuff on your phone too um, so the one bad part about NOAA, NOAA weather radio is is it alerts a large area unless you've got same encoded uh, devices so you can, um, the, th the thunderstorm could be th down south of the airport and I live in Oro Valley and I'll still get alerted on my, no on my old NOAA weather radio. Um, now on the phone I won't because that's site specific depending on where you're at. So if you're, if you're driving along um, on I-10 going to Texas and there happen to be a warning and you happen to be in that polygon area, you'll get the warning on your phone. What What's that? No, it, 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 your, your phone, it, if you got a smartphone, it, it'll, and you got the technology built into it, it'll alert you right away. Um, you can also download the Tucson News Now weather app. It works for whatever location you are, to the minute, the latest weather data. It's TucsonNewsNow.com, thank you. <laughs> 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 you know was it the radio? Was it was it an app you were talking about, or is it some? Or? No, no, well, no. With the radio, we, we got the transmitter sitting up on on, on uh, Mount Lemon, and it just sends out radio signals, and you get a you know get a um, you know, weather radio that, that picks it up. So all our forecasts are on that, and if we put a warning out, it'll it put out alerts out, and it'll it'll it'll, it'll you know chime up the weather radio saying there's a weather kind of kind of like in the Midwest when there's tornado warning out, you hear the sirens or severe thunderstorm warning. Um, but the technology's gotten there to a point where you can get on your phone now, too. So the, the, app, the warnings I get on my phone that just magically appear here when I'm in Denver, how do, how do other people get that? Again, if it's, if it's issued by the weather service, it, 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 it should go on. It should be on your phone. I mean, we're, it should be like the reverse 911 right. sort of thing. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, right. and, the, and the two Sundays no weather app, I'm not going to say this. <laughs> you can turn on your current location and, and in all seriousness, it, it will pick up your current location and send out anything that comes from the weather service and it still goes to your phone. Right. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
lots of ways. Okay, I think we probably have time for one more question, and I plan. I promised him. Sound like you? She promised me. My name's Jerry. I've been subscribing to the Star since March of 1975, Ooh. and my question is directed to Tom. I miss the evaporative cooler column. <laughs> Can we anticipate seeing any more at all? It was one of my favorites. Well, a couple things have happened. Uh, number one is I, I don't write a column for the paper anymore. I write about science. And number two is I no longer have an evaporative cooler. Uh, I, I, I kept my evaporative cooler for as long as I lived in a leaky old casement window uh, brick house. Uh, and, and I no longer live there, and I found that uh, air conditioning is actually uh, uh, more pleasant. <laughs> and and it's, it's just as inexpensive, the newer air conditioners, as that, that cooler was, and I'm not wasting water. Uh, but yeah, I always enjoyed writing about fixing my cooler, and regardless of what I was writing about, whether it was you know, how we have to get rid of Evan Makeham or Fife Symington or whoever the governor <laughs> under indictment was at the time. <laughs> People would come up to me in the grocery store and say, you're Tom Beal, I love that cooler column. And they wouldn't say anything about these hard hitting columns. <laughs> um, and, and I wish I still had that connection, but I'm afraid I don't. Okay, Tom, any closing comments or thoughts? Uh, the only thing I want to do is, is thank these hardworking people once again. I, you know, I mentioned that Heidi was working on that. John has to leave here and go to work. Um, Mike Crimmins is supposed to be on sabbatical, all right? But, but, but he, is <laughs> he is also you know, finishing up with his grad students and students at the same time, and he's here. And Kevin, are you working today? <laughs> is this your day off? Is this your day off? No, actually, I, I did the 5 o'clock and I came here and I'm done. Okay. He came from work as well. So <laughs> thank these people for taking time out of here. And thank you for being here, asking such wonderful questions, and, and, and for reading the newspaper every morning. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all.